So here we have our acceleration equation where acceleration is going to be equal to that gravitational constant times the mass divided by the radius squared. So we're going to use this equation in order to figure out what the mass of the Earth is, uh, which means we've got to figure out every other part of this equation. So the first thing we do is we figure out the acceleration. Now we're going to use pendulums in order to figure out the acceleration due to gravity um, because that oscillation back and forth basically has a certain amount of time that it oscillates dependent on, number one, the length of that pendulum and the acceleration due to gravity. So if we can figure out that pendulum just by calculating it with a, a stopwatch and then the length, we can do that pretty easily pretty much inside the classroom. We can determine the acceleration due to gravity and then that acceleration due to gravity is going to be that acceleration that we're going to use um, in this equation. So that gives us that. All right, so check on that one. Next, we're going to figure out the gravitational constant. Cavendish was actually uh, the first person to really accurately measure the gravitational constant. This universal gravity constant was actually tried to be measured by uh, Newton. Uh, him and Kepler worked together, and Kepler had the data. Newton used it for his equation, and he got pretty close. It wasn't too great, but it was, uh, it was pretty good considering that uh, they were looking at astrological objects like comets, asteroids, moons, and things like that. Uh, but Cavendish was uh, set up an experiment, and effectively what he did is he used uh, this fiber here, and that fiber, what it does is when you rotate a fiber or a cord, a cable, then there's a torsional force that it, that it pushes back with. So he set up this rod that has these two masses. These two masses were then brought closer. They were hanging from this fiber. Uh, then they were brought closer to these two other masses that were sitting on a stone tablet. And that stone tablet was actually um, floating on a pool of mercury. And the reason he used mercury is because, number one, stones float in mercury. But number two, any vibrations or anything outside of his experiment, those vibrations would not be able to make it to his experiment. So it kept the uh, data very accurate in order to do that. Then he used this light source in order to reflect off that mirror uh, onto a scale in order to determine how much of that fiber, that, that cord rotated. And using that, uh, he could figure out that force of gravity uh, because that torsional forces would be equal to the force of gravity. Then you could easily figure out the two masses of the object. So that's pretty easy as well. Um, and then with those masses, he could then use the distance between those masses uh, to determine um, the, the denominator of this equation, and then that only leaves the gravitational constant, and he used all this data to figure out the gravitational constant very accurately, and then that helps us in order to figure out the gravitational constant that we use in this equation. Um, so that checks that off. The next part of this equation is uh, from an actually an Egyptian named Eratosthenes. Eratosthenes, uh, what he did is he traveled between two towns, Alexandria and Aswan. Um, now, with that, he noticed between the two towns that there were some shadows in one place where there wasn't another. So you notice the curvature of the Earth. Um, in Aswan, and when he was in Aswan, a certain time of the year, he noticed that the light shined straight down into the well, just straight down into it. Um, and then he traveled north to Alexandria, and when he traveled north to Alexandria, he noticed that that same uh, light that cast, a, that cast no shadow on the well cast a shadow in Alexandria. So what he did is he determined that uh, using the shadows and using the angles, he actually helped determine the radius of the Earth. So knowing that light is essentially parallel when it comes in, you got the light coming in here um, and here for those two towns. Um, and then using that shadow, he could determine what the angle is up here. And that angle being alternate interior to this angle down here, uh, he determined that that angle was 1 50th of a circle. And if that angle is 1 50th of a circle, then that means this distance right here, this what we call an arc length, is also 1 50th of a circle. And since that arc length is 1 50th of a circle, then we take that arc length and multiply by 50. That gives us the circumference of the Earth. And then we can use that 2 pi r in order to figure out what the radius of the Earth is, and that gives us uh, the radius. Now, the way Eratosthenes did this, it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly precise. You know, he used the, the rate at which a camel would, would travel, would walk, in order to determine what the distance was. Um, also, Alexandria is not perfectly north due to... Uh, not due north due to Aswan. So uh, it wasn't great. It, it was actually pretty accurate considering what, what he did, but it wasn't perfect. Uh, we have better measuring equipment now in order to determine the radius of the Earth. But that's, um, that is now known in that equation. So with all those things known, we got the acceleration due to gravity with pendulums. We got gravitational constant uh, 
uh, used by Cavendish, and then we have the radius of the Earth by Eratosthenes. The only thing left is going to be the mass of the Earth, and that's actually how we know the mass of the Earth is 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. So the next example says Earth is pulling on a 3.5 times 10 to the 5th kilogram asteroid with a force of 1.72 times 10 to the 6 newtons. How far away is the asteroid from the center of the Earth? So solving for R, what we get is we get that R is going to be equal to the gravitational constant times the mass of the asteroid times the mass of the Earth. So that's G times mass 1 times mass 2. Now instead of dividing by the radius squared, we brought the radius squared over to the other side. And then that force of gravity we brought into the denominator. Now because the radius was squared, then we had to square root both sides. And because we square rooted, then, then uh, we go ahead and plug in our numbers. Uh, we're at 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11th. That's going to be our gravitational constant. And then 5.98 times 10 to the 24th times 3.5 times 10 to the 5th. Um, that's going to be our two masses divided by the, the force of gravity, which is 1.72 times 10 to the 6th. Then we square root everything after we put that in our calculator. We get that the distance is going to be 9.0 times 10 to the 6 meters. Now that's 9 million meters away, and that sounds like a pretty far distance. But if you keep in mind that the radius of the Earth is actually uh, about 6.38 million meters, then this is actually pretty close considering that it's, it's within one radius of the Earth. For this next example, let's suppose that you and your significant other are sitting on the couch together. Your significant other kind of slides over closer to you and you look over and I'm like, what are you doing? They look at you and say, well, I heard that anything that has mass has a gravitational attraction towards any other mass. Um, you kind of look at them weird, but uh, let's actually figure out what the force of gravity would be between you two. So let's suppose that uh, one person's mass is 85 kilograms, the other person's 55, and you're a healthy distance of 1.5 meters apart. So in looking at the force of gravity, you got the gravitational constant, which is 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11 times the uh, 85 kilograms times 55 divided by 1.5 squared. Don't forget to square that denominator. So then you uh, go ahead and calculate that. You get 0 0.00000139 newtons. Now, if you punch in your calculator, you may get something like 1.39 times 10 to the negative seventh Newton. So there is a gravitational force between you. But let's uh, let's actually look at other forces. Uh, if you have a gravitational force between you that's that's sliding you closer, then that means you would have friction. Uh, so let's suppose just somehow you had the most slick surface of a couch you could possibly have uh, with a coefficient of static friction of 0 0.0001, which is more smooth than anything that we could possibly have on Earth. Um, but let's suppose that you do. Um, and if in that case, that means your force of friction is going to be equal to coefficient of static friction times normal force. Um, in order for you to start sliding, you have to overcome that static friction. So you have to have at least that much force. Uh, so since you're dealing with a horizontal surface, and that means the normal force is going to be equal to the force of gravity. So you take 0.0001 times 85 times 9.8, and you get a force of friction that's equal to 0.0833 newtons, which is still a small force, but it's much greater greater than the force of gravity would ever be in order to uh, cause that person to slide over towards you. Next example, let's suppose that we uh, look at Earth. Earth has 81 times the mass of the moon, but at the surface of the Earth, we only have six times the amount of gravity. So with 81 times the mass, you should have 81 times the force of gravity. But for the surface of the moon, compared to the surface of the Earth, we only have one sixth of the force of gravity. So Earth only has six times the gravity of, um, on, the, on its surface than the moon. So why is that? How is that possible? Well, the reason is because there are actually two things that affect the force of gravity, not only by how massive an object is, but also how by how much distance you have from its center of gravity. So if you're on the surface of the Earth, you're actually further away from Earth's center than if you're standing on the surface of the moon than you would be from the center of the moon. So the reason why you don't have 81 times the force of gravity on uh, the Earth than you would on the moon is because you also have a larger distance. You're a further distance away from the center of the mass, so therefore you would have a reduced amount of gravity. Now, 81 times the gravitational force uh, caused by the, the distance would reduce that gravity, but it's still going to be six times as much gravity. So Earth still wins over as far as the, the amount of mass it has winning over uh, rather than its distance. So the radius of the Earth, because it's bigger, would reduce that distance, but not enough to uh, have an equal amount of force or gravity on the Earth and the moon.